welcome Skyward. So welcome everybody. We are here in our seventh uh, Gap Fact Industry Partnerships Subcommittee meeting, and uh, we're really glad to to get started here in our new schedule. Um, wanted to um, say that we've got a lot going on here, and we're definitely on track to to our first in-person meeting. Looking forward to meeting everybody when we do that for sure. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just to do a quick check and see who's here. And uh, let me take a look at my list. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start here. All right, so let's see. If, and I know Farad is out today. Um, Denise, I see you. A little bit of a romper room here. Uh, Gail, I see you as well. Nicole, I see you. Uh, Susan, don't see Susan. And Mamie. Don't see Mamie and Daryl, I know, um, was not going to be here. She did contact me. Christine, I see you. Gotcha. Stacy, see you as well. Nigel, I see you. And Keith, please don't see Keith. Uh, David, yeah, I think I saw you, David, as well. I am here. Okay, and again, Kimberly also heard from her that she wasn't going to be able to join. And I see both Troy and Cassius. Great. So um, what I'm going to do very quickly here is I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, our fearless leader for the Industry Partnerships Subcommittee, and uh, we'll get started. We do have some public participants that drop in from time to time, so we'll be on the lookout for that. But uh, Kristen, back to you. Great. Thanks, Boris. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see everyone. Um, Lots, lots on the agenda today and over the next couple of weeks. So just to remind everyone, we will be prioritizing our recommendation list and narrowing that down and then formulating those recommendations over the next several weeks for the May 4th meeting. Um, towards the end of this session, we'll talk a little bit about some of the administrative lift to get that done and what we can expect over the next couple of weeks. For today, we're really pleased to have a guest speaker from the organization ACT IAC, and I'll cover that in a second. And I think that conversation discussion is going to be quite robust based on a pre call Farad and I had uh, earlier last week. So, really looking forward to that. Then we'll open it up for public comment. And then, whatever time we have left today, we'll dive back into our recommendation list. Um, I've created a spreadsheet that we can go in and start to put in those assessment criteria we talked about last time. So I appreciate everyone being here and I think we'll get right into it because I think we have plenty to talk about. So I'm super pleased to introduce Soraya Carrera, who is coming to us representing ACT IAC. That's how the outreach started, uh, American Council for Technology and Industry Advisory Council. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that, but she is a former federal procurement officer. So as we learned more about her, Farad and I got more and more excited and asked her more and more questions. And I think she'll, she's gonna be a great resource for us uh, today and as we go forward. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Soraya. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you for having me today. Uh, thank you to the, to the uh, Federal Advisory Council. Uh, hopefully, I won't bore you too much with all the details that I've provided in my slides. I'm going to share a slideshow with you, but I thought I'd tell you a couple of things. Um, I've been a member of ACT IAC uh, for probably about 25 to 27 years. So during my federal career, I was a member of ACT IAC and then subsequent to my federal career. And one of the reasons that I did that is because I like what ACT IAC has to offer from a government as well as industry perspective. And you're gonna hear a little bit about that. As Kristen mentioned, I am the former chief procurement officer at the Department of Homeland Security. So in answering some of your questions, I hope to share some of my own experiences in engaging with industry and some of the things that we did that were unique to us. So I'm gonna share my, slide, my screen now because I do have some uh, slides here and I hope I'll do this right. See, I got this right. There we go. And share. And let's see. Does that work? Yep. We can see your screen. You see the slide? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because me, I see me. <laughs> and I'm going to put it in slideshow mode so that it looks a little nicer. Oops. That didn't work. I'm Here we go. Okay. 
So you should have a full screen of the slide. And of course it tells you that I'm here today to talk to you. So the first slide, I wanna introduce you to who the American Council for Technology Industry Advisory Council is. I won't spend a ton of time on this, but suffice it to say, it is a public private partnership focused on government technology. So the role of the organization is really to garner information and exchange information and, and promote the learning and understanding of technology. We are a nonprofit educational organization established to improve government through the application of information technology. And we are an objective, trusted and ethical forum because we remain vendor and technology neutral. APT-IAC is organized like a coin. That's what we like to describe it. One side of the coin is APT and the other side of the coin is IAC. On the next slide, I talk a little bit about the American Council for Technology. This is the government side of the coin. It was established in 1979 and authorized by OMB and GSA by government employees to provide a forum for the exchange of ideas between federal, state, local, and government employees. It gave an opportunity for them to communicate and collaborate on technology, technology issues, how technology was emerging and how they might apply technology in their environments. It's governed by an executive committee of senior government executives. The, the government, uh, excuse me, the executive committee sets the strategic vision of the ACT organization. And then they protect the integrity of the collaborative process by making sure that folks follow the rules. And there is an extensive policy manual and approach on how we work together. The ACT is a membership organization, individual membership. So individual, individuals can sign up to be members of the organization and membership is free for government employees. The Industry Advisory Council was, stand, it was stood up about 10 years later to provide an objective and ethical and vendor neutral <clears throat> forum for government and industry to collaborate. Because it's not enough just for the government to collaborate amongst themselves. We need to hear from industry. We need to understand from industry some of the challenges with some of the technologies and how we are applying them in our environment. Today, IAC has approximately 500 member companies, 60% of which are small businesses. It's a corporate membership organization. So it's companies that join the organization and their dues are based on their government revenues. So it is a, a graduated level of dues depending on the size of the company. Because again, you're trying to keep it affordable for all the member companies. It is also governed by an executive committee that's selected by the IAC members, okay? So the membership actually votes and selects who will be on the committee. And that executive committee then uh, advises and supports the ACT, I, I, excuse me, the ACT Executive Committee. It's a lot of acronyms, I apologize. <laughs> so what are our guiding principles at ACT IAC? So I mentioned it is a nonprofit organization for those who know IRS rules, it's a 501c3. And our mission is to strive to improve government outcomes through collaboration and partnership. And that is truly the key objective. It's to make sure that we're constantly looking at how we can help government, how we can make government better, stronger, more efficient, and more effective. Our activities are objective, transparent, ethical, and vendor and technology neutral. And you'll hear vendor and technology neutral often. We don't care what that technology is, and we're not interested in who sells it. We are interested in understanding the technology, and how it can be applied, making sure that people understand not only technology, but roles, responsibilities, and how best to use those technologies. Um, it's it, Again, we are an educational institution. So our education programs contribute to a more effective workforce by providing both opportunities for government and industry to, to come together and learn together. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the education programs that we have for senior mid-level and junior level personnel coming into organizations. We provide an environment of trust that is earned and preserved by not using our activities for sales or lobbying. And that's a very important distinction for ACT IAC. There is no sales when government and industry are together in a room. We're there to collaborate and learn, not to hear about sales pitches or anything like that. So just want to share that. So how we work. So all of our activities are outcome-based. Every conference, every program, every meeting, anything that we're doing, has an intended outcome. And that outcome is to produce something that improves government, be it a white paper, a report, or perhaps a forum or a training program. Our goal is always to make sure that we're doing something to improve government. 
Our programs include leadership and engagement by both the government and industry. So typically, if we are having a forum, uh, for example, uh, 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 a conference or a webinar, there will always be a government chair and an industry co-chair. So we always have representation from both. And our, our, our conferences and webinars are hosted and supported by both. Meaning when we bring panel discussions or speakers, we're bringing panels from government and industry. And I say government because that does refer to federal, state, and local. So we include all forms of government. And we do include academia as part of our, our uh, presentations and part of our membership. Technology is our unifying theme. So it's not, but it's not the end game, right? It's not about go buy this technology, go use that technology. It's more about, you need to know about this technology, you need to understand it and you need to understand how you can use it. So while it's our unifying theme, it's not the end game. We're not trying to tell anybody what technologies to use or, or when to use them. Um, we serve all functional areas, and this is a little bit unique as well. So this includes program management, acquisition, HR, finance, security, you name it, and yes, including IT. Yes, a lot of our members come from the IT community, but we also have representation, and later on you're going to hear about our, our communities of interest. We have communities of interest around some of these functional areas as well. And then we are a volunteer-driven organization. So our volunteers come from both government and industry, and they help lead the organization and create the programs and drive the outcomes that we derive. So again, what that really means is they come together and they put ideas on the table. Here's something we need to learn about. We need to learn about the ethical use of AI, or we need to better understand how to implement cybersecurity uh, rules across the federal space and how we can help contractors be more compliant. So the goal is always to provide some capability for government and industry to learn together, to come together and understand technology and how it is applied together. So this next chart is pretty busy, but this infographic comes from our website and it tells you the story of ActDiac. It tells you everything you need to know about ActDiac in one simple slide. So it talks a little bit about some of the things that I just mentioned, but the most important thing that I wanna point out is our community is a large one. It's about 16, I think 16,000 individual members, 8,000 government leaders and 8,000 corporate leaders committed to improving the missions and outcomes of government. We come together to collaborate, provide leadership, and education. That is our goal, that is our objective. And we do so through a variety of forums. We have communities of interest. So we create communities of interest around topic areas, areas that uh, uh, resonate with our membership on areas where they need leadership, they wanna explore um, uh, capabilities, explore and understand new rules, technology, et cetera. So today our communities of interest are acquisition, customer experience, cybersecurity, emerging technology, evolving the workforce, health, IT management and modernization, networks and telecommunications, and we do have one on climate change. That's one of our newest communities of interest. And the way the communities of interest are organized, it's members. It's, it's members that come together, much like like, like your uh, um, subcommittee, they come together and we have a government lead and an industry lead that chair the meetings of the communities of interest. And the communities of interest will lay out a strategic plan that says, here are the things we're gonna look at. Here are the topics we want to explore. And then they'll organize around those topics and produce webinars, uh, 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 excuse me, conferences, white papers perhaps, or even bring in speakers to help understand and sometimes even come up with ways that we can train people on the topics. And the folks that participate in this are not necessarily of the discipline. So for example, the acquisition community of interest is not a bunch of procurement people talking to each other. It's a mix of, of uh, uh, functional areas and interests. So it's extremely important. Um, and, and what I think, oh, now I'm gonna go to the personal side. One of the things I like about these communities of interest, it really helps small businesses understand the business of government because typically small businesses, especially newer ones, that's where they have difficulty really understanding what government does, why it does it, how it does it. This helps promote that understanding by bringing these groups together. Not to mention that it also creates 
opportunities for networking and meeting your peers across the industry and across government. So communities of interest is the way we do it. And the communities of interest, each of them have working groups. They'll establish working groups for all the different areas. So here I'll talk a little bit about climate change because I know that's an area of interest. We do have a climate change working group. It is uh, chaired by a federal uh, employee and an industry employee. And they've come together, they've called us together. They have three working groups that they've identified. They've coalesced their membership. And in fact, they have a forum coming up on climate change on April 17th, okay? So, um, and I can get you more information about that group because they're always looking for volunteers. So if anybody on this, uh, on this uh, council would like to volunteer, they're always looking for help, okay? So, um, so now I'm gonna move on to the Federal Insights Exchange. The Federal Insights Exchange is, is one of our newer programs. And the goal of that uh, uh, insights exchange is to help people understand what government is doing. There are agencies that participate. These are regular agencies that come in and periodically come in and talk to our membership, small business, large business. We pull the membership together and they'll share initiatives, challenges, and opportunities for industry. And what I mean by opportunities, opportunities to help resolve challenges. So it helps industry understand how perhaps GSA or DHS is organized, how USDA might be reorganizing a particular program area or a particular program that USDA might fi be finding challenging and want additional help and support. So that's what I mean by opportunities. It's not selling, it's really helping people understand the strategic di direct direction, excuse me, strategic direction, initiatives, challenges, and opportunities. This uh, in Federal Insights Exchange is actually even beneficial for people that work in government because you don't always know what the other agencies are working on. You don't always know what these other agencies do. And you will see that we have GSA, DHS, Commerce, VA, NASA, USDA, Treasury, State, HHS, Interior, Transportation, Justice, DOD and the Intel community, Education, and EPA. Very differing agencies with very different missions very important to understand what they do. And we continue to add agencies as we find uh, others that want to participate and discuss with us some of the things that they're doing. So again, focused on what the, what the agency is doing, what are the strategies, their plans, their initiatives, what are the problems or challenges that they confront and, and the opportunities to help them. So I'm gonna to move to the right, talk a little bit about some of our forums and webinars. Well, before I talk about forums and webinars, I'm gonna talk about the Institute for Innovation for a moment. The Institute for Innovation was stood up, it is membership based. So members of ACT IAC can further their membership into the Institute for Innovation. And the Institute for Innovation is basically the research arm of ACT IAC. They craft innovative solutions and strategies through collaboration that span all the functional areas. So it's not just about IT, it can be about acquisition, it could be about cyber, it could be about health. One of the projects that they were working on when I uh, joined the act IAC team uh, recently as their, as their senior advisor, use cases on how to buy cloud. Um, helping put together uh, white papers and approaches and use cases that we could publish to the community on how best to plan, and execute cloud purchases. Not what to buy, how to buy. What are the things you need to be thinking about? What are the kinds of questions you should be asking? Even looking at how some agencies have done it and what evaluation criteria they use and where they had successes or uh, ran into challenges. So the idea behind the Institute for Innovation is really to put forth innovations, innovative solutions. In fact, Little uh, background in the Institute for Innovation is where we stood up, if I remember correctly, the periodic table of acquisition innovation that's out on the FAI website kind of started here at ACT IA. It was the idea was brought here, they started foraging, and then we worked with GSA to get it uh, implemented at FAI. So it's called the periodic table of acquisition innovations. So next. Um, I'm going to talk about our forums, and I have a chart on, on our forums, upcoming events that you might be interested in, in attending. A lot of them are in person, but we do hold some virtual events. So we have four major events that we do every year. One is Imagination, the Executive Imagination Nation. Imagination, I can't say it all fast, I'm sorry. Imagination Nation, 
Executive Leadership Conference. This is a conference, generally participation is anywhere around 900 to 1,000 people come to this conference. It is typically a two-day conference and you get some of the greatest leaders in government, industry, and academia, and we share and discuss and exchange ideas. The Executive Leadership Conference has been in effect for years. It is very well attended. It's usually hosted in, uh, now it's hosted in Hershey, Pennsylvania. It used to be in Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, but we outgrew the venue in Williamsburg, Virginia. And that, like I said, it's very well attended by industry and government and speakers come from all areas, including academia. Um, topics range, we have uh, not only panels and keynotes, but we also have breakout sessions for particular areas of interest so that the membership can focus in on things that they really wanna learn about. So the Executive Leadership Conference is the flagship of ACT IAC. The second largest conference is our Emerging Technology and Innovation Conference. That's typically held in Cambridge, Maryland. It typically happens around May. Uh, I think this year it's in early May, May 6th through 7th, May 5th through 7th, excuse me. It's this Emerging Technology and Innovation Conference is just about that, to talk about the new technologies that are coming in, how they're being used. We have an opportunity to hear from agencies and industry, how they're applying these technologies and any innovative uses and approaches to these technologies to improve service to the customer. Because ultimately that's what this is about, fulfilling the mission of government and making sure that we're doing it in a way that consistently improves government and supports uh, the, the taxpayer, if you will, the citizens and the people who come and visit and work in our country and study in our country every day. So those are the two big summits, uh, excuse me, two big conferences. Then we also have a Health Innovation Summit, which is a very widely attended. In fact, the next one's coming up soon. And we also have a Shared Services Summit. Again, these are smaller. These are typically one day, half day events, uh, but very well attended. Uh, and again, the people that come to these meetings are the top talents in government as well as in industry. And then we host other webinars and forums. We have half day sessions, sometimes one day sessions. We host a whole bunch of events. So I would say that on average, ACT IAC has something going on at least once a month. There's some kind of either conference or webinar or discussion forum outside of the communities of interest that are open to, to our membership. Uh, probably about once a month on average. Okay. And by the way, I should say that the speakers, how we select speakers, because the, the process I've, I've participated in the process quite a bit, um, the membership, the, the membership names names, they provide names we'd like to hear from. We think this would be a great speaker on this particular topic. And the, the membership actually decides what the topics are going to be. They, they nominate topics for consideration for each of these events. We'd like to see a panel of, I don't know, uh, senior procurement executives from across the government to talk about procurement innovation. We'd like to hear from a CIO panel on how they're using AI responsibly. Um, so the point is that these panels and these speakers are actually selected by the membership. So ACTIAC is an organization that focuses on its membership and focuses on the learning and collaboration of that organization by including them in all the programs and how we develop those programs and, and, and uh, uh, deliver them and implement them. Okay. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit very quick about professional development. Um, we have several professional development programs. I mentioned that at the onset. We have a partners program that's for senior level executives. We have a voyagers program for mid-level managers that aspire to become uh, executives. And then we have an associates program for entry level professionals. These three programs are designed to help people gain the leadership skills that they need in the businesses that they're in. And the goal of the program is really, again, bringing industry and government together in a learning environment. So they learn together. They go through the program together. The sponsors of the program come from the membership. They're typically leaders in our community and they'll, you'll always have a government and an industry sponsor, again, for each of these programs. And we bring in guest speakers, we organize events around them, and we even sometimes have offsites with these. In fact, I know that they have offsites uh, as part of these programs for learning opportunities, but the goal is leadership. Leadership in, in, the, in, the, in the implementation and use of technology, leadership in running organizations that implement technology. 
We also have a fellows program that brings in the alumni from the Partners and Voyagers program. So it's an alumni association within ACT IAC. We call it the Fellows Program for the graduates of the Partners and Voyagers program. And they organize events together and promote the learning and the continuous collaboration. And here's something that, that is always very interesting. I still run into people who were part of the Partners and Voyagers program 20 years ago. So that tells you something about the longevity of the program, how people come together and stay together and continue in their membership with IAC. And I think that speaks volumes to the, uh, the environment that has been created. We also have a program, Growth in Leadership for Women, or GLOW. This is a leadership program for women in government IT. So it focuses on women in government IT. And it's kind of a four month program and they go through some training and they have conferences and webinars together. Again, growth, for, uh, growth in leadership for women in IT or GLOW. And then we have an ACT IAC Academy that does provide training when training is desired, when the membership asks for us to promote training or deliver training. And we actually use commercial entities to provide uh, that training. So that's a little bit about our uh, educational program. And now my, one of my favorites, the Small Business Alliance. For those of you who may know me, you know that I'm a huge small business fan. I, I always advocate for the small businesses. The Small Business Alliance uh, was stood up by Act IAC, and I'm going to move on to the next slide because this tells you what I'm about to say, was stood up when, they, when Act IAC realized how many small businesses we have in the community. We have about 60% of our IAC members are small businesses with annual government revenues under $30 million. So we stood up the Small Business Alliance in 2014 to promote the interest and, and, the, and the contributions of the small business community at Act IAC. Um, excuse me, in, in IAC. Our, we, we host programs and events that are specific for engaging the small businesses and creating a stronger connection across the community. So in other words, they're programs designed for the small businesses, but we might we bring in the large businesses that are part of the membership to help mentor and guide and network with these small businesses. Um, it's a great opportunity for small businesses to meet each other, to learn from one another, but also to take advantage of all that ACT IAC has to offer. Our goals are to educate and support small business growth, provide programs that provide opportunities for them to forge those partnerships, and to recognize the exceptional work that small businesses do in the technology community. So we do have awards programs. We host small business forums on a variety of topics that are for the small business community at ACT IAC. So we have category management, we have an emerging tech and innovation uh, uh, conference for them. And we also have one coming up that's called Taking the Mystery Out of Certifications. I, I think that one's being done in, in uh, conjunction with SBA to help, again, small businesses understand government, understand the government rules, why we do things the way we do, and to have an opportunity to ask the questions that frankly, sometimes they're not comfortable asking to an agency specifically or directly. And again, we also promote networking events. We have Small Business Alliance networking events, periodic, I think we have them like about quarterly. And this brings an, this is an opportunity to bring, again, the small businesses together so they network with one another, but also with the companies, uh, the large companies that are part of the ACT IAC and the government officials that are members of the ACT IAC community. I generally attend most of the Small Business Alliance uh, forums and the network opportunities, because again, it's about connecting these companies and helping answer their questions. And then um, I think I covered everything that's on that monster slide. So the next slide just tells you some of the events that we have coming up, because we certainly invite you to come join us and come see what we do and how we connect with industry and how we bring industry together in this private partner, pr private public partnership to learn, collaborate, and understand. And then my last slide here invites you to our homepage because I think the effects of an act I act can't, you can't even talk about it enough. You gotta go see it. You gotta see some of the reports that we write, some of the white papers that are out there, some of the interviews that we conduct. So our homepage is at actiac.org, but we have a podcast called The Buzz and we interview leaders in industry and government 
on IT matters. Sometimes we do introspectives, people who've retired, they did mine, they did Mary Davies recently. And then we have a radio show that is hosted by our CEO, Dave Wenigren, Accelerating Government with Act IAC, where he talks about topics of the day. What are we thinking about out here in this community? What are the challenges that we confront? And how can we continually improve government and help the workforce better understand uh, the missions that they serve and how they can use technology to better serve those missions. So with that, I'm gonna stop right there and open it up to you guys for questions. I mean, I can talk about act IAC and, and engaging with industry all day long because it's one of my favorite topics. It's one of my favorite topics. Awesome, thanks Soraya on that. I really appreciate it. It's good backdrop and just to provide some context for the discussion. So for our uh, subcommittee, We've kind of uh, partitioned our areas of focus into uh, recommendations that will uh, enhance engaging to expand the supplier pool. So one of our guiding principles is that we want to make sure we're making recommendations that um, are specifically centered around small, mid-sized, underutilized businesses, as well as innovative new entrants in the climate sustainability fields that can come in. Uh, you know, do no harm kind of mantra. So we're, we're kind of hypersensitive. We have a filter on everything we're looking at to do that. And we had a lot of discussion around outreach versus an engagement and meaning something that's effective. So in that light, I guess what I'd love to hear, and we'll get some of the questions started is, you know, and this can be through ACT IAC or through your experience in government, as we discussed, mm -hmm. you know, what are some ways, what are the best practices in engaging effectively where it brings in new businesses, retains new businesses, helps businesses grow from your experience? Okay. So I'm going to talk both ACT IAC and I, I am going to share with you some of my personal experience because this was an area that was near and dear to my heart as the DHS CPO, that I was very interested in making sure that we weren't just always working with the usual suspects, that we were bringing in new companies or companies that had not done business with DHS. So new didn't need to mean a company that just started, it could mean a company that's just never done business with DHS. They've either stayed in the commercial side or worked with other federal or state and local organizations. So from an act IAC perspective, um, hosting these events, is the way we bring people in by by talking about a topic that is of interest hosting seminars conferences and providing this opportunity to collaborate that lures people in because here's what act iac offers it's a very neutral forum this is you get to talk to government officials you get to hear from government officials sometimes it's hard to get government officials to open up in some of those areas when people are trying to do like sales to them, right? They'll go, they'll attend, they'll talk, but this opportunity to really sit down and collaborate. Let me give a couple of examples. For an agency to come in and say, we're thinking about doing a best-in-class contract for IT services, and here are some of the categories that we're thinking about including. What are your thoughts on that? That's the level of collaboration we're talking about. There's nothing wrong with that. It's very good because you're gonna share with the industry anyway, but it gives an opportunity for an agent to sit down and talk about what are the challenges to this? How hard would this be? What kind of work should we be including in here? How should we write this? What should we be thinking about, right? So again, it gives this opportunity for government to come in and say, I have this challenge, help me understand how I can make this challenge better. A good example is cybersecurity. We developed a playbook on compliance with cybersecurity to sensitize both government and industry to what the rules are around cybersecurity. You know, what are, what are all these rules that are coming out? I'm trying to simplify it, but also to help people understand roles and responsibilities and to sensitize the government to some of the challenges that industry is gonna face with compliance and to sensitize industry to what are some of the requirements, why the government is imposing certain requirements. So the idea is, again, that learning capability, that ability to break it down and make it in plain English and simplify it for folks. So that's, that's what act IAC does. And through these conferences, these webinars, these papers, et cetera, it draws people in. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about my personal experience. When 
I came into DHS as the chief procurement officer. I had two goals in mind. One, two, well, I had a gazillion goals in mind. Let me go back. But I had two goals when it came to industry. One was to improve how we engage with industry, how we communicate with industry, the level, the type of information, and what we got back from industry. And then the second goal was to take the fear out of our workforce of talking to industry, right? Because uh, a lot of times in the contracting community, there seems to be an apprehension to engaging with industry directly, especially once the solicitation goes out. So to do that, what I decided was that instead of having conversations that are strictly revolve around opportunities or solicitations or contracts, how about we talk about business processes? And I stood up a variety of forums that we called reverse industry days, where through the industry associations, I invited them to sit in front of a government audience and talk to us about their business processes from a small, medium, large individual consultant. How do you approach things? What do you think about when you see a government solicitation? What drives you to participate in a competition? When, how do you make your decisions to team? How do you make your decisions to bid or not bid? What does it cost to bid? These are like the kinds of topics that we were learning about. And we went on and expanded it even to technology topics to have companies help us understand how they implement technology. Reverse industry days became very, very popular. And I believe they're still in use at DHS because it was an opportunity to promote learning. It took the handcuffs off, as I like to say, because you're not tied to a solicitation. You don't have to worry about what you're saying, just talking about process, business processes. And what I found was that our program managers, especially, but our contracting officers loved that learning experience. They loved understanding what is industry looking for? Why do they ask the questions that they do? What do they think about when we send out an, uh, an RFP or an RFI? And in the end, what it did was it strengthened the communications. And how I did that was I reached out through industry associations. We kept the running list of every industry association that was out there that we knew about. We even found some that nobody knew even existed because there were actually industry associations for startups. So we went out and found and we kept this running list of industry associations and that's how we worked with industry. It is almost virtually impossible, and I don't care if you do a data dump from Sam, to get to all those vendors that are out there. But who has that capabilities is those industry associations. You hit up about 150 industry associations with an email blast that you're doing something, that's gonna get out to thousands of companies, small, medium, large, non-government, commercial, you name them, they'll, they'll, you'll, you'll find them. So I strongly urge that you do a combination of outreach where you go out to these industry associations and say, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find these small businesses that sit in underrepresented communities. By the way, that's what the government's doing right now. That's, that's literally what they're doing. They're going out and trying to find these companies that are out there in these underrepresented communities. HBCUs, great way to find uh, companies that are out there, right? Um, and we know what underrepresented communities look like, right? We, we can go to the Census Bureau and get that kind of information. But the point is industry associations can really reach a, a, a volume of people that you really can't. So that's why those memberships are valuable, you know, the people that join them. In fact, um, when small businesses, new small businesses come in and they ask, you know, what are some ideas that I have in my consultancy for them? I do tell them that, you know, pick one or two industry associations and become a member because that gets you connected that will get you access and connection to people that can help you continue to develop and grow. And it provides you mentorship opportunities, you know, mentors that you can turn to. So I right. hope that was helpful. No, and I think it helps. And just for context for you and, and the rest of the subcommittee, you know, one of our potential recommendations is to create almost like a digital data exchange around all of the industry associations, all of the advocacy groups. You just brought up a good point about uh, HCBUs and other academic institutions, you know, so that it might not be left to be dependent on the person in the agency keeping a list. So that is one of the recommendations we're kind of really taking a hard look at. Uh, as we go forward. Let me just see with the, um, I've got a lot of questions, but I want to open it up mm -hmm. to the subcommittee here. Any questions or comments uh, that you want to engage with Soraya on? Nigel. 
Hi, uh, so Hi. thank you very much for that. Very, very helpful. Um, with regards to the industry groups, uh, there has been a program called the Community Navigators, which really helped fund them to, to really do this aggressive, proactive outreach to go find companies in specific NAICS codes yes. to bring to the government. What Can you provide some uh, input on that or what you believe about that program and how that could be? It was just a one-time funding thing. Right. Um, but I, I know uh, uh, Senator Cardin is very focused on trying to extend it a little bit further. We'll see how that goes. But given where we are now, how would you recommend us, because we have to put this in the form of a recommendation to GSA, mm -hmm. how would we then encourage that engagement through that network mm -hmm. for them to go find the companies on the ground that are in these unique industries that are just burgeoning, like solar panels and renewable charging stations? How do we get that? So I'm, I'm going to answer that a little oddly, so bear with me. So I don't know that we have to go find them. We have to help them find us, if that makes sense, okay? And let me explain what I mean by that. We, and I'm sorry, I left the government in July, 2021, and I'm still there. So the we is the government, okay? I, I do this all the time. The government has to do a better job of letting people know they exist. I mean, I know that sounds like weird. We know that the government exists, but what I mean is, how do you get access to the government? So what we have to promote is greater transparency that we're here and that we're looking for them. Because I don't know, yeah, you could come up with a gazillion programs and you're still not gonna get to those folks. People are found if they want to be found, if that, if that makes sense, okay? What I would prefer to see is enabling companies to find us, to have access, to here's what the government buys. Here's what these agencies buy. Here are the kinds of products and services that they're looking for constantly. Here are the kinds of contracts that they award. Here's the programs that they have to simplify the buy, right? So that you don't, you know, you can go for part 12 and we can negotiate all terms and conditions. I just got technical on you. But my point is that we have to help companies find the government because it's almost hard for the government to go out and find these companies because companies are building every day. Every day, a new company comes on board, right? Um, the consult independent consultants, small companies, small businesses, companies break apart, um, large companies sell to one another. Keeping up with that is really, really hard. But I think that the best service that we can do, and, this, and I've believed this throughout my career, is make ourselves accessible. Here we are. So one of the things that I used to do was host an event once a year at DHS, and they still do it, that I called the Strategic Industry Conversation. And the purpose of that conversation was just to tell industry who DHS was, just to say, here's who we are. Here's what we do. Here are the missions we support. Here are the kinds of things we buy. And by the way, if you want to know a little bit about our small business program, go into that room. If you want to understand how we do uh, purchases with... Um, uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs or others go into that room, right? The point was that we created opportunities for people to learn who we were and what we were interested in. And I think that's going to yield a much better outcome than us just going out and trying to find companies because here's what I'm going to say. So now I went out and found these companies. Now what? See where I'm going with that? Now what? Exactly our problem. Which now is <laughs> They reach out, that doesn't necessarily mean that helps them get contracts. Exactly. That doesn't necessarily mean the government gets the benefit from working with them. It just means you check the box to say you did outreach. And Thank that's you. what we've been trying to get to. Exactly that point. And that's why I think where when we tell people out there, people, the masses, here's what we do. Here's what we buy. Here's how we buy it. Here are the rules. Here, we'll show you. We'll teach you the rules people will be drawn to us and that, and then they'll come in and they'll go to the right places. This is the most important point. Companies don't get frustrated because doing business with the government stinks. So you hear some of them say that, hey, no, what they get frustrated is not knowing where to go, not knowing which agency or what office in the agency or what person. And if we can create that capability that externally facing capability, and I know you're going to tell me, oh, we got web pages and all that stuff. No, I mean, really out there, 
where people can really learn, they're gonna come to us and they're gonna come to the right place. And then they're not gonna feel as frustrated that somebody banged on their door, spent an hour or two with them and said, oh, come join, sign up for the system and blah, blah, blah. And then they don't get any work. So I'm going with this. Yeah. That's, that's really, I, I just say that as a woman, a minority, and a business owner now. I mean, I'm not doing business with the government, but this is what I'm, the feedback I'm getting from companies is like, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know where to go. So we have to do a better job. Our government should be that transparent. That's, I, I, I'm just going to say it that way, that transparent. And it's not one agency, it's every agency. You can't say SBA does this. You can't say GSA does this. It has to be all the agencies because that's how they're going to apply. By the way, I, I'll tell you a funny story, a little anecdote story. I learned about a, a group, it's, it's in commerce, I believe it's commerce or NIST, one of those, manufacturing. They know who all the manufacturers are across the country. They know every manufacturer. They have regional offices, a government entity. You know how I found out about that? Through a contractor. And I worked for the government for 41 years. I never knew. Sorry, was that Manufacturing Extension par Partnership? Yeah, that's it. The Manufacturing okay. Extension Partnership Program. I found out from a contractor. Really? <laughs> and how many you know people don't know about it, right? That's my point. Well, I think we've we've kind of we've explored that in both subcommittees I'm on. We've one of the revelations that's come out of this discovery work is there are things and there is knowledge out there, but it's not pervasive and it's not. Um, so we talked about the challenge program, Boris. I think last time about to to attract innovative new entrants, but you know it's got to be a bright light. You know, and I, I keep thinking about this lighthouse effect. Like it's got to be a very bright light that's easy to see, and then it's easy for people to gain access and get the information they need for for their business. So. Yeah, it's going to be like a glass door and people can see in. I guess yeah. the way I describe it, right? Some transparency so that it promotes companies finding, because you coming and knocking on the door, like I said, frustrate you, not you personally, but us going and knocking on doors isn't going to buy anything and it might frustrate them. Whereas, yeah. and the other thing is companies have to be ready to come in, right? So we got to have programs that help companies understand how the government operates. What, it do, what does it mean when you bid on a government contract? And I'm gonna dare say something and I don't mean to be insulting to my community. We also have to have programs to educate our own people on how to help industry understand doing business with the government. Can you, can you explain that part a little bit? Cause I think sure. teaching the teachers mm -hmm. a little bit cause it's, it's one thing to give them resources to say, okay, well, hey, MEP, you've got the database of manufacturers go bring them in because we need somebody to manufacture electric vehicle charging stations. It's a different thing to teach them how to provide that knowledge base navigation capability. How does that work? So first of all, we got to take the fear out of talking to vendors, right? We got to take that fear out of our community in general. There is risk aversion because of protest. That's really what drives that, that people say, well, you gotta be careful. You don't wanna tell one vendor something that another one doesn't have, yada, 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 yada. Um, I never had that problem because it didn't bother me. I know that what communications with vendors is about is making sure that you don't give one company unfair competitive advantage over another. It's got nothing to do with what you talk about. It's making sure that you're not giving unfair competitive advantage to a particular company or group of companies that others don't have. So, you know, and there are smart ways to do that. Um, that education process has to do with two things. One is an education process. You need to understand what your government does, how we do business with companies. In each agency, we know how we do business with companies. We know what kind of contracts we're going to work. We know the types of contracts we work. That's easy. What people don't always understand are the industries that they work with and how those industries differ from one another. And so we have to do a better job of making sure that we're, we, when we talk IT, we have the right IT people in the room. When we talk about HR, we have the right HR people in the room. If we're gonna talk about bioterrorism, we have bioterrorism experts in the room. The contracting community is not gonna know anything. What they have to know, the contracting community, what they have to know is that there is an expert out there that needs to be at the table with me having this conversation with industry. 
That's the way we're going to educate people. I didn't learn IT because I read a book. I learned IT because I worked so closely with the CIO community that I was one of them. They saw me as one of them. They invited me. They showed me. They took me to server farms. It was really exciting. They took me to server farms and that kind of stuff. That's how we teach our community to talk to industry. And we also ask industry, how should we talk to them? We ask them, how do we help you? And there are organizations popping up that do some of that now. You know, um, there's a group that just started up. They're looking at, un, I think they're looking at minority and underserved um, firms, underserved communities um, called Fed Propel. They're relatively new. And they provide training to companies on, you know, how to do business with the government, how to conduct yourself, how to look out, how to look for opportunities, that kind of stuff. I hope that answered your question. It's a tough one. It's a toughie. So Soraya, one of the things, so this entire conversation, if we now put a lens on it around um, our mandate, which is around advising GSA, um, and we're really focused on climate, uh, sustainability and climate risk and how changing requirements may or may not impact the supplier base, the acquisition workforce policy. And so when we think about that challenge, um, we know this current regulate uh, requirements that are somewhat, somewhat not, you know, in existence and there's potential new requirements coming down the line. And so can you talk to us about how you see what we just talked about, connecting the organizations, leveraging um, data and transparency to help the supplier base be more capable with these requirements so that they can thrive in the federal marketplace. That's kind of what the problem we're kind of trying to make recommendations around. Yeah. So, so this is where like an organization like IAC is actually quite helpful um, because we focus on the understanding of what we're trying to achieve as opposed to the what. In other words, we don't care what it is you're measuring. We care about, so what are the rules around that? How does a company comply with that? How does the government look at that? We're not focused on the what, it's the how. How can we help you understand what this thing is, whatever it is, technology, uh, new requirement, whatever, how, how would we help you understand that? And then how do we help you see it from both perspectives so that you can remain in compliance, so that you can actually fulfill the objective of any new legislation or any new requirements? So um, we create things like white papers and playbooks or host these conferences and webinars and discussion forums where we bring in experts that can break it down for you into plain English, experts that can talk to companies and government officials together to hear their questions and answer the questions in plain English, it, to say, this is what we mean when we say X or Y, and this is what the government does, and this is what industry does. And it gives the opportunity also for industry to push back, right? To tell, to tell um, these experts, well, here are some of the challenges with doing that. Here's what happens in my particular industry or, or with the particular types of products or services that I support and why I have difficulty doing this. Or it enables a government agency to say, well, okay, that's gonna cause me these kinds of problems because here's what I have to do to adapt to this. The point is that by having people come together and talk with the experts that are in the business, that's how we promote that learning, that communication. Are you gonna, are you gonna get to 100% of the people 100% of the time? No, but you are gonna get to people. And, and by the way, one of the things I love about our, our business is it's kind of like one of these things that when you tell two friends, they tell two friends and they tell two friends and you know, it does proliferate out there. Data does get out there, believe it or not. Information, especially if it's good, does get out there. Okay. So I hope Morris. that is uh, a good response. I hope. I hope. I hope I answered. I didn't mean good response. I, I answered your question. Yeah, appreciate it, Sorry. I want to drill a little more. Two have two questions. One is drilling a little more into GSA's role because the the recommendations will come to GSA, and, and you've been around mm -hmm. that that space for a while. 
just wondering how would we as a committee here, this subcommittee really look at so what you might think it might be some low hanging fruit type of things that could be done. That's one question. The second one, if you can talk about a use case or an experience where you guys build recommendations that really went somewhere mm -hmm. on a on a maybe a similar challenge. So those sure. are my two questions. Sure. So first of all, um, GSA has an important role because because GSA is the government's buying arm, right? They they hold the big programs for buying and they provide a lot of the guidance, the direction. And in many instances, they lead or they work with other agencies to help lead where our community goes with things, right? How, how we make things happen. Um, and GSA has probably one of the best connections uh, to industry. They're called the schedules because whether people like the schedules or not, they're on there, right? You have them in all kinds of categories and you have thousands of companies out there on the schedules. And you even see the shift of companies on the schedules, right? So GSA has a wealth of information and data and access and capability to do that, provided they get the budget, right? Um, throw that one out there. Anyway, so um, what I would say is GSA is probably what I would call a good information exchange point. Um, kind of like what we do with SAM. I don't, I don't want to use SAM, you know, the system for award management because it's like not that great. Um, it's okay. It works, right? But, but yeah, thank you, Nigel. I, I didn't want to be negative, you know, now that I left the government. Um, now I'm relying on it, right? But, but a clearing house for information, a way of posting, hosting, and sending information out. That's what I think GSA could do very well. It's what it does with GSA schedules today. Whether you like them or not, the data's out there. Think about it. You click, 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 boom, you find it, right? Um, sometimes you find more than what you want, but you find it, okay? So that's what, that's what I think GSA can do well, is, is help connect industry with the government so that they can learn more about government and kind of know where to go when they're looking to accomplish something. Um, use cases, I am a huge fan of use cases. I love use cases. I think telling stories is the best way that people learn. And at act IAC, we have several initiatives, uh, IT use cases, but we also did uh, the periodic table of acquisition innovation, which FAI hosts. That's an example of use cases. So there, innovations in the contracting and procurement process are posted so people have the artifact, the story, and the lessons learned. And they also have access to who did the work or the group that they can go talk to to learn more about that work. I think use cases is a great way for teaching and learning, especially for that one-on-one, -on -one, because not everybody is always comfortable going into a big group setting and asking a question. But when you can go out and, and hit on a table and download information or go look at templates or find out who to talk to, that yeah. promotes learning. And I will tell you that some of the best um, ideas come from that level of collaboration where people look at a use case and go, oh, well, I see you did it this way. Did you try this? And why didn't you do this? And why didn't you do that? And they engage in a conversation. All of a sudden, they come up with a new approach. So I really think that use cases are, are uh, in, incredibly valuable. Um, having a library of use cases, you know, and we, we probably would always start with technology because I think technology is always the tricky one. And I know that at IAC, through the Institute of Innovation, we've been working on that. How to buy cloud, AI, RPA, et cetera. We've been working on that. And it takes time to accumulate those use cases. Sometimes agencies aren't willing to share uh, their successes or their failures. Um, and that's the other thing. We got to get the stigma out of failure. You know, if you're doing everything right, that means you're not doing much. I, just my philosophy in life. If you're not stubbing your toe, if you're not upsetting somebody, you might not be doing enough. You're not stretching enough. Because when you stretch, you're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. We learn from those things. Sarai, I had, um, I, thank you. It, good questions too, Boris. But um, I have two kind of, questions um, that are not really related. So one, one, one is more just to get your thoughts on. So one of the recommendations that we're potentially looking at is, you know, creating a climate uh, sustainability, climate risk in acquisition 
type playbook or maturity model similar to the similar to the cybersecurity model. So it would have like the knowledge and the skill sets and the capabilities and you know for for industry. Uh, and it sounds like that's a lot like your cyber uh, playbook. So A would like to get your thoughts on that. My second question is, I'd like to get your thoughts around you. So you know, lots of organizations have like a small business center of excellence forum working group whatever we want to call it and many are now starting to have climate uh, working groups this is how you and i got connected i reached out to the act i act climate working group um and in some of the other subcommittees they've reached out to state organizations and one of the things that kind of keeps i hear is yeah we're working on that but it's really hard to get it moving you know and you know it's so you have all these independent small groups working on the same problem, but there's no connective tissue there mm -hmm. where we could get, you know, kind of economies of scale. And um, so does an organ, would, has ACT IAC, you know, thought about how it works horizontally with other groups, um, you know, so we particularly around climate, right? This driving force of, hey, protecting our planet and doing things differently. Um, okay. I don't know that that's a little bit of a loaded question. So I'll just okay. throw it out there. So I'll start with that question first because I might not remember it later. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, no, so a couple of things. Within ACT IAC, all the communities of interest interact with one another. So it's not uncommon that somebody from the acquisition COI is sitting on working groups for the climate. So I, in fact, I know that because we have a, a working group within the climate uh, 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 community of interest that is focused on acquisition and the federal acquisition regulation. So they invited in folks that sit on the acquisition uh, uh, co uh, community of interest, the procurement experts that are there and some of the other uh, program officials that are there. Um, we also work with other industry associations. It is yeah, that's really uncommon. where I was going. Yeah, that's yeah. where I'm kind of going it, with this. Yeah, yeah, it's not uncommon to create partnerships with other organizations, National Contract Management Association, FCEA, and others. If we have something in common that we're working on, it's not uh, uncommon for us to reach out to each other. And also academic institutions. Academic institutions also play a role. So you have a person like me, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a member of act -IAC. I'm a member of the National Contract Management Association, okay, another uh, uh, membership organization that's focused on contracting community. Sometimes I bring them together to have a conversation because I know something's being worked on one side that the other side might have an interest in. I'm also on the board of advisors for uh, uh, George Mason University. I'm also an APA fellow. So we come together with organizations and reach out. In fact, Dave Winogrand, right? He's, uh, he's one of the chairs on the board of NAPA and he's our chief executive officer. So there are always connections happening and we're always reaching out to each other. And if we hear, for example, if we're at a meeting and we hear that, I don't know, uh, a firm uh, one of the industry associations that focuses on small businesses is doing something in particular, you might reach out to them and invite them to come in and share with us what they're doing, to talk to our small business community about what they're doing. So those connections are out there. They do happen. They do happen. Um, and, and especially with the industry associations, because industry associations tend to be very public with what they do. Right, because, because they post on their website, we're gonna have this seminar, we're gonna talk about this, we're gonna have an event coming up and they post well ahead of time too because they're inviting membership in. So the, the reality is those connections are made real well. I'm not sure that in government, we're good at making those connections, right? Well, that, that, that we're not duplicating each other's um, initiatives, if you will. And, and mm -hmm. part of that, you know, there is uniqueness to an agency with, with the speed with which they move, et cetera. You know, I've had some people when I was CPO that, you know, people come and say, oh, I'd like to work with you on that. And I go, okay, let's do it. And then they're, well, but I need like three weeks. I'm like, no, I want to do it yesterday, right? So you have some of that that happens. Uh, and then resources, you know, different agencies are resourced very, very differently. So sometimes people have the best of intentions to participate, but they can't. So I think the connection is there. Act IAC does that very well. I know NCMA does that, you know, because I sit on the board of NCMA. NCMA reaches out 
to other organizations to bring them in so that we can work together. And of course, we always try to include academic institutions, especially um, for, for that learning pop part, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to, to bring in whether, um, whether it's professors or even students uh, from the academic institutions, we do bring them in to, to help us. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, no, it maturity, does. It's just maturity model. Yes, yes. Okay, everybody yeah. knows what a maturity model is, right? So that's a great tool, all right? Because everybody understands it. They understand how it works. Um, I think the trick with a maturity model, the trick that you're going to have with climate change, is I don't think that's going to be as um, stable as it sounds, you know what I'm saying? It's gonna be very dynamic. It's gonna be constantly evolving and changing. That's what I think on climate change. That's my two cents worth of opinion. Oh, good, I'm not saying it's bad, no. thing, but that means it makes it hard to stabilize on a maturity model, right? No, no yeah, constantly moving targets. And yeah. The, yeah. the example we had was, you know, we, we were talking to some large entities and, you know, their, their kind of reaction was, you know, it's not that hard to calculate greenhouse gases. And then we were talking to separate entities that were more small business minded. And the comment was, it's they're really challenged calculating their greenhouse gases. So the problem is all from how you look at it. But right. part of the role of government, I think, is that I love that um, posting, hosting, and handing out I, I, yes. that whole concept. But that can be done relative to some of these industry groups too, yeah. reverse, yeah. say, hey, tell us what your small business groups are doing. Tell us what exactly. you're doing on climate change um, and to make sure there's some continuum there. So that might weave its way into some of our things. Yeah, Let me I just, open, one, if oh, I sure, one go one ahead. On the maturity model, I'm not saying no to a maturity model. I just think it's too early because we still don't even know where they're going. Like, right, you know, I just saw, cause I just commented on the, um, I was through NCMA, we commented on the FAR case on, you know, certifying greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions, right? And I thought they did a good job defining, you know, scope one, scope two, scope three, et cetera. All, all that's really good. All that's really good. Now let's go put it into practice, right? And, and then I look at the practical side of the business. I'm in the acquisition business. I'm in the procurement business, right? So immediately what I think of is the first time that somebody does a non-responsibility determination, how fast do you think that protest is coming? Think about that. Okay. The, the, yeah, right? It's gonna happen. And who knows how a judge might decide it, right? So, so that's why I don't think it's good to move too aggressively on a maturity model to kind of understand the call, you know, the effects of some of these things, because there are unintended consequences that pop up all the time. Oh, and mm -hmm. by the way, when I read that thing, my comment was, and we have a lot of exceptions in there. You got to be careful when you put exceptions in anything, because exceptions yeah. tend to become the rule. Yeah, great. No, great feedback. Thank you. Let me uh, just open it up to the rest of the subcommittee. Any questions? Any further questions for Soraya? Or any, oh, hi, Nicole. Yeah, it's just a comment. This has just been a tremendously useful uh, moment to spend with you. I think I have um, learned so much and taken away so many nuggets of wisdom. And, and I can absolutely see how what you have learned on your pathway will inform the work that we're undertaking. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, and I think we'll be looping back with Soraya in the future as, as we, um, one of the things we talked about was as we curate these recommendations, you know, it'd be good to socialize. Sure. Um, one, of, one of the assessments we have, we have all these factors is, you know, what, what do we think the industry buy-in commitment will be to this recommendation we're making to GSA? Mm -hmm. You know, have we socialized it with GSA? But I think, and I think groups such as ACT I Act and these advocacy groups, and if we're able to connect them, will play a huge role in one of these goals is in like really moving the lever. Yes. On, you know, climate and sustainability in, in government acquisition, like really moving the lever. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we had a lot of conversations around some of the small business goals and they're and they're well intentioned, but they don't always um, they don't always result in the intended outcome. Uh, yeah, but climate, I, you know, like you're either saving the planet or you're not kind of. So, yeah, I, I, I will tell you that, um, you know, that that was one of the things that I always struggled with, you know, when I was looking at goals, I, we met 
at, or exceeded our goals. DHS got straight A's on its small business scorecard. We were always really good about meeting our competition goals. And when the category management goals came up, we met those goals. But I used to always say, so what? Um, that sounds cynical. So what? So I, I got the competition done. But what did I get out of that, right? We're not, I don't know that we always measure the outcomes. And that to me is the challenge. When we talk about, you know, um, expanding the industrial base, so what? I want to expand it where people are going to bring great capabilities, new ideas, new approaches, better products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How are we going to measure that? It's not just who you got the contract. It's the, the right people get the contract, right? The right companies with the right yeah. resources, right? So, so I always tell people that when you're thinking about doing something, always say, so what? What's the so what about it? If you can answer that question, we're good. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, thank you, Soraya, very much. Uh, you. Last call for the team here. Any other uh, questions or comments? I just want to thank you for um, your presentation, but I really, what really um, struck me was sensitizing the government on understanding industry, the industry perspective, because I've been on both. I've been a government contractor and I've been executive over procurement for state government. Yeah. And I had training with my uh, procurement officers sensitivity pretty much training with my procurement officers because I said we just cannot just push paper every day and 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 not recognize and understand and pretty much uh, empathize sometimes with the vendor. Mm -hmm. I mean we will you know at some of the times my procurement officers will would um, not award a contract because a minority business didn't put, or didn't add one number to the next code or something like that. Yeah. I said, do you understand the level of effort that it took for them to put this proposal together? $20,000, mm -hmm. $25,000. So I like that perspective. And if more government um, work, the, the government workforce were more sensitized mm -hmm. to all of the business processes and practices and activities that really go on in those businesses, they would be you know, they would take a second look at some of the procurements that they award or not. Yeah. So I thank you for that. I agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think creating that common ground, common perspective mm -hmm. uh, into, with, with respecting the unique, you know, requirements yeah. and roles of each. So I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, so, oh, so Nigel. If I could, one thing. Um, of course. While you were at DHS, we had worked with back then Chairman Benny Thompson to create these centers of excellence mm -hmm. that brought universities similar to the FFRDC model. Yeah. Um, that was really around, you know, DOD has it for their defense research institutes. And then uh, we tried to do something very similar with regards to DHS. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that came from like things like cyber and, and, and those types of things that were national defense, non-DOD. I'm trying to be- Right, yeah, exactly. Here my thing here. <laughs> yep. um, as we are looking at a GSA recommendation, could something like that be done around climate change and sustainability with the university networks? Because um, a lot of these schools are now building these climate change and sustainability curriculum. Um, is that potentially something, and I see, I see Gail on here, uh, Gail was set with, with Bowie State and the stuff that they're doing at Bowie State is just innovative and, and leading the field like we would do something is that something where a federal government agency and I, I know we focused on DHS and DOD previously but is there some way of doing something similar where the research and and curriculum that's being created at university campuses can create a benefit to the federal government somehow and can be funded through the federal government research process or, or, or the, inst the infrastructure that already exists. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. I think it can be done. What a couple of comments that I would make is that we, you know, we need to make sure, though, 
that we don't silo the learning. And let me explain what I mean by that. When we started out down the path on cybersecurity, and I'm going to talk about this because I know a bit about it, right? Because I was very actively engaged. We started out with like cybersecurity is this discipline, right? And we got to teach this thing. And, and we kept talking about cybersecurity. And we weren't talking about cybersecurity impacts everything. Think about it. It impacts everything. Everything we do, our daily lives. It impacts you, me, how I use my home computer, how I use my phone, et cetera. Cybersecurity is bigger than just this one little thing. And I would argue that the same is true for climate change. I really would. I think that climate change, forgetting your philosophical beliefs for a moment, climate change impacts everything we're going to do. And so what I, what I caution is that we don't get too narrowly focused on climate change and then have to come back and say, oh, well, wait a minute, we didn't think about it this way. We got to think about it not only vertically, but horizontally as well, across the domain, across the enterprise. Um, I think we sometimes overly narrow the focus in government when we, when we get hung up on a phraseology or a term if that makes sense. But do I think that, yes, you can create a center of excellence to promote that learning? That's what we're doing with quantum and other things. That's, that's going on. I think it's um, uh, Morgan State University has you know, a huge quantum program, right? And they're working with the Quantum Literacy Network to educate people on what is quantum and how does it work and how can it secure our infrastructures? So yes, do I think you can do it? And I think academia is a great way to do it. Um, and I think engaging our, you know, historically black colleges and universities and other networks of universities in minority areas, um, you know, don't get this wrong, the, 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 the big name colleges are good, I'm not saying they're not, but we got to start digging into these other schools that have a lot of talent and expertise that can be brought to bear. Um, to help solve our problems. So yes, do I think Centers of Excellence is a great idea? Of course it is. I helped develop that model at DHS. <laughs> well, particularly, I mean, maybe you could narrow the scope even a little further relative to it from a GSA perspective. And this ties, Nicole, definitely into what your subcommittee is around, around, you know, acquisition, contracting, procurement in federal government, all right? right? So instead of trying to take on the whole world, just saying, right hey, can we really make this pervasive in at least this part that we have the most control over? Right. Um, but, but, I, but I do caution that we still have to have that awareness every, in everything else. Oh, right? absolutely. Because what happens is if you don't create that awareness, then you fall behind the power curve because then you got one group running around going, no, 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 climate change, climate change, and everybody else is going, what are you talking about? So yeah. you kind of want that awareness. I, as I used to tell my staff, I don't need to be expert in what they do. I just need to understand enough about what they do to remember to include them, right? Because yeah. if I understand, if I have understanding of how you play a role, then I can bring you into the conversation and mm -hmm. I know when to bring you in the conversation. So that's kind of what I'm alluding to. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. But then as we refine into recommendations, you know, one of, the, one of the things is, hey, don't recommend something that you can't implement, like that's not implementable, right? So let's Correct. make sure it, yeah. So just thinking about it in, in that light, implementable and, um, and usable i if i if i can never forget the user experience i i have to throw yeah, that one drive it off as i used to tell my staff bring me the person that's going to bang on that keyboard you know it's great we may have you know uh, us collectively can come up with some great ideas and some great notions and it sounds really good but how is it really going to be implemented? How is it going to impact that contract specialist, that contracting officer, that, that individual that's writing a proposal, that, that person at the company that has to certify? How does it affect them? We got to talk to those people to see how they're impacted by the things that we're thinking about doing, right? How, what's their benefit? What's their value? So that's what I would recommend. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to keep your number handy, if you don't mind. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you so much for what you guys are doing and thank you for having us here today. And if you want any additional information on ACT IAC, I do encourage you to visit our website, but also just give us a call. We're always there. Great, thank you, Soraya. Thank you all, have a great evening. That was wonderful. Thank you, Soraya. Very, very helpful for all subcommittees, not just this one, but all three. Thank you. Okay. And Nicole, don't worry, I'm here for acquisition workforce if you need me. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, guys.
So I think at this point um, on our agenda, we'll open it up for public input. And you can either, I believe uh, public can speak or uh, put it in the chat, is that correct? Yeah, that we could do that. I'm looking and see who's here, but I, I do see that Maria and Fred are here. I know maybe it's an opportunity for both of you if you wanna chime in on anything Absolutely. you heard on these conversations. And Maria was right on your wellhouse here. Um, so yeah. just interested to see if any, any insights, anything struck you interesting on, on this conversation, probably be good to hear from you, from both of you. Well, I love the fact, you know, that she said, just going around and finding these companies is going to be hard to keep up with, but having them find us, you know, that I think that was like, it really sort of sparked something in me that uh, maybe we have been going about that. Not, not that we don't, we, we still need to have this list of industries and I'm not saying that, but I think what she's saying is bigger than what we, what we were thinking. And I think that's, that's a really good lens to look through, um, which I don't think we had looked through before, or we assume, I think we have assumed that people know how to find us, right? I, I think, that probably is a mistaken assumption that we've been making all this time, that they do know that we exist and that they know how to find us. So I think that was an eye opener. I, I definitely still, regardless of what she says, I want that list of industry associations she has to compare with, with ours because we could still um, we could still use that. I think one of the things she brought up, she kept talking about a lot, which I, I you know, I, I want to talk in a less public forum to her about, or even with you guys about, it's it's the, the idea of the academic institutions, because I think that's the challenge for GSA. Like there are a lot of agencies that do grants. GSA is like one of the only agency that doesn't do grants and funding in that financial assistance. And so they would just, we were sweat up, we acquire goods and services. And so when you're talking, when you're talking about working with academic institutions and HBCUs, that becomes the challenge because there's money that needs to, you know, go to fund certain things to get the benefit from the academic associations, from the HBCUs. And so I, you know, I don't know if there's any way around that, but I, I see that as a challenge or the, the sort of handicap GSA has in its mission. And, uh, but yeah, it just, th those are two thoughts that I had that, um, that struck me for presentation, so. No, that's, that's good to, that, I did that just learn that fact that they don't, so GSA has no like really funding authority to create the Senate. So if, say that was gonna be one of our recommendations, like does it have the authority? That would be a no. Yeah, we don't do grants. I mean, no. I don't know why we don't do grants, but I mean, if you think about our mission, um, you know, most of it is products and services. Uh, I'm sure there's an opportunity for research somewhere, but. I, and I have no idea what the history of that is, but that is just not an area that we we don't use a non-procurement common rule, which is what governs grants. We always use a FAR and the GSAM. So I have no idea the history of that or why that is, but that's the way it is. Nigel? Is that something that could be an interagency partnership? Maybe we may the Department of Commerce, because I know the Office of Economic, uh, the Economic Development Administration does grants uh, MBDA does grants. Is there some way of partnering where the, the guidance comes from GSA? Because they would shape what it would look like. Um, or maybe something interagency with EPA or something like that. Is there some way of bringing various entities together to stand something like that up as a model? And then maybe have the grant making entity be outside of GSA? But it's always going to come down to the funding source, right? So if we remember how we started this out, it's for the benefit of GSA. And if the rest of the government can use, it's fine. So um, yeah, so it, they're always going to come out. Okay, so even then GSA would have to give the money over to 
whatever the grant making agency is, which again, I don't know appropriations law, so I don't know how, you know, how they can do that. But that's, that's an, I, I, what I think we should do is just explore if there's a possibility of doing anything, whether whatever you are suggesting or any other method of, of dealing with this. So that, that could be a suggestion. Yeah, and I think, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sure, okay. Well, actually in this administration, um, they are, uh, the Biden-Harris administration is promoting for the academia, HBC, MSIs, whatever, to um, um, solicit or they're soliciting contracts for targeted to HBCUs, MSI, tribal, um, tribal, what is it? Tribal oh, communities. Yeah. So um, we do have a vehicle or we do have an avenue to um, respond to contract solicitations now, but it depends on the ages. And so yes, some of the, Academia universities and HBCUs do have GSA schedules, but the um, challenge is if the agencies are going to um, actually do business with the universities, or are they going to shape or target opportunities for those universities utilizing the GSA schedules? So that's the challenge. Can I, can I ask Gail what what? products or services do these uh, universities uh, offer on? Can you give me some examples of well, what they Well, we are, let's say it this way, we are developing, I'll use Nigel's um, phrase, a business mix, mix here, at least here at Bowie State University. We have been awarded, um, let's say cooperative, um, cooperative grants also, which, you know, are kind of like uh, uh, utilized in a form of contract. But NIH, for example, NIH solicited their first direct contract to HBCUs just before the fiscal year. And they sent it out and it was competitive. It was a small contract, but this is the first time that they ever solicited a contract targeted Specifically, the eligible applicants had to be an HBC. Okay, so what what they're they, they're using the GSA vehicle, but but uh, they didn't use the GSA vehicle. This right. was a uh, procurement vehicle, and I, you know what? I don't even know what it was um, because we bid it at, and we won. Um, With NIH, you said yes. right. Yes. So yeah, that that makes sense. If you're using a contract vehicle and, and an agency is 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 or if you use the GSA's vehicle, uses that contract vehicle to contract for services that or whatever needs they have. What what we're trying to get to is what GSA actually spends its own money to buy. It's different it's from training. having a service that a vehicle that GSA everybody uses, but GSA is not the one actually you know, spending GSA's contracting dollars with the HBCU. Well, that, that's well, what I'm trying to get an example say, of. Okay, Bowie right now is um, working on getting that GSA schedule. GSA can award a contract at Bowie State University for training. That's goods and services. For training, okay. okay. So training, that's, I mean, and that's example. one thing, you know. Okay. That, that's, that's an example. Okay. It can be other, other, um, you know, real goods and services that we can provide. We, we have project management um, expertise here. You know, we, we have cybersecurity um, and we can create that to be a goods and service. So this is what we do in some of our co-op, but we can take this offline, but see, and that's the other challenge. Well, I think we need to talk we about this. That's what we need to hear. Right, right. We have to educate the agency. Exactly. That's what I'm doing now. Yes. Educating because the agencies want to do business with us. They exactly. just don't know how. And the only way that they know how is through internship. But that's not the only way that you can do business with academia. You, okay. we, we do have goods and services that you can procure. But anyway, that's another subject, but it's all about as, uh, you know, as we've been talking about today is the collaboration and respecting each other's views and opinions and using that to create the solutions by which we want to get to. 
I think we need to have continued dialogue on this subject. Thank you very much. That was very educational. <laughs> yeah, and, and I noticed, uh, Gail, thanks for sending in some of your feedback too. Like we, we really hadn't addressed kind of that interconnectivity with the academic institutions uh, in subsets of those in any of our recommendations. And so might be an interesting thought as we go into the, um, the spreadsheet there. So let me see any other um Maria, we know which we know which recommendation you'll be the champion for. I'm gonna fill in that cell immediately. It's I'd just like to jump in uh related to one thing that you said, Maria, that really, really like stuck in my ear, and that relates to the research component. And um entities like EPA and other agencies have their own research grants that are available specific to areas that they're trying to internally innovate around. And I think that potentially this hasn't existed within GSA because innovation and procurement haven't traditionally gone hand in hand, except that especially around issues of sustainability, and this is just one example, um, innovations at the core of this and thinking differently about how to achieve the organization's strategic missions and the strategic mission beyond GSA, because the extent to which an organization recognizes its procurement as being strategic and providing broader benefits to its stakeholder community, it adds value to the organization, but many organizations don't think of it that way. Um, Kristen, I don't know if this is a, is a potential recommendation for us or if it's with the policy committee, because it would require mm. some change in policy, but um, I can see where if GSA is serious about moving forward and pushing the needle and really thinking innovatively that we should, as a subcommittee and as the GAP fact, think about how we connect with this. I love that idea and and potentially maybe it's discussion at our next chairs meeting where we can talk about this um you know i had an opportunity to hear the faz commissioner speak and nicole you are so right innovation you know procurement at this scale given supply chain risk climate risk trying to be inclusive of small businesses this, there's big data, there's there's AIML, so like that, there's innovation that needs to be brought to bear. Um, I so that that could really formulate into kind of a um, a nugget for the broad committee, right? That's kind of goes across all three. And I think so, a hundred percent. But one thing I'd like to add there, it's not just um, I don't want to call it a loophole, but because uh, it's a legit um universities can provide procurement services as if they can contract with the federal government the same way and bid on contracts the same way independent companies can. So that could be a tool. And that's one of the things I've tried to work with a number of HBCUs on, which is changing their business mix to include not just the research and development side, which is the grant side of things, uh, which I think was Nicole talking about, but also on the actual servicing of government contracts. So the actual work of some of these things that would be out for RFP can go to a Bowie State University in partnership with all of these other uh, innovative companies in order to deliver for the federal government. So I'd, I'd like us to keep that in mind as well, that that could be a way that we, if we can't go through GSA for grant making, maybe we can go through them for procurement targeted to institutions, universities, and so forth. Nigel, I think those are exactly the kinds of ideas we're looking for. And then what Nicole said, Gail, Nicole, Nigel, you all are saying things that are necessary to change the way we think or have been thinking about this and 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 actually proposing some you know when we say don't give us a uh, recommendation not implementable everything you're saying sounds like we can do something about that even if it's starting with having these institutions come in to educate us and so i think this this is great i think this is exactly sort of where we want to go with 
with some of these recommendations. So yeah, thank you. I agree with everything, everything everybody said. And I wonder, I wonder if some of them will up up the spreadsheet. Um, I wonder if some of that discussion around procuring with the um, academic institutes can fall under that fast track targeted procurement type effort. It could be training. It sounds like it could be socialization, but uh, but let's let's go. If we're ready, I can go ahead and call that up and socialize that with everybody. Um, that, that would be great. And Kristen, you know, if it's a HBCU, you can sole source similar to sole sourcing to an 8A company. So you can sole source to Bowie State or Morgan State. Uh, I believe they have, I need to double check this guys. Uh, I think they are of the same thresholds as Native American companies and Alaska Native corporations. So you can sole source up to 25 million in civilian agencies to an HBCU. And that would also help, you can put provisions in to help trigger, you know, bringing commercial, bringing things off the shelf, you know, new technologies, new innovations off the shelf for the commercialization. We can include that in that process, but there are ways of doing that. Okay. Without a long Let time. me, um, well, can you, I don't know what you guys are seeing. Can somebody, what are you seeing on the screen? <laughs> Sorry. Your Zoom, your Zoom main page with a red background. Oh man, here we go again. Let's try this. Let's pull this over here. I just want to make sure. Um, uh, stop share. Okay. This is when I need Boris to come to my rescue. Desktop <laughs> one. Okay. All right. This is probably going to be super small to see. What are you seeing now? Yeah, that looks good now. We can see the, the matrix. All right, let me mm -hmm. move this thing. Okay, so mm -hmm. what what a, what I thought we could do is I um, took these recommendations, we can wordsmith them later, get them refined, um, and we could kind of go through and just quickly, um, it may, we may have to do some of it today and then we can pick it up on the admin session um, next week. Um, how we want to kind of assess these. I think when we prioritize, we can come back to outcomes, measures, goals. But the way this would kind of work is so like we have a recommendation one, these are not in any priority order. We can, um, you know, this creation of a maturity model. Recommendation two was around this creation, deployment of an industry networking group directory exchange. Maria, that's your list but in a digital kind of way, like of all the, how do we create that light? Number three was around the customized procurement acquisition vehicles designed to fast track. Specific, we had specifically expand the supplier pool with innovative new sustainability and climate entrance. We, this is the one I was thinking where you could almost add direct to academic institutions uh, into this. I think it would fit here if, if the group thinks so. Uh, we had the digital marketplace number four of best practices. I can't find my scroll bar. And um, five was around the large supplier incentive uh, to small, you know, all, um, all rising seas lift all ships. And then the six was around providing a higher level of data access, fidelity and transparency, creating more accurate representation, reach program effectiveness. Those were kind of the six we had. Um, and so what I thought we could do, it'll get easier as we do more than one, but if we were to go, let's start with number two, because I think this is the one we have our greatest resolution around. So if we were to say, talk about this, creating this directory exchange of suppliers, um, industry partnership groups uh, that was always being updated by the participants um, and then would be accessible to all of government. So when they're doing engagement and outreach, um, you know, is that something that's within GSA's purview? And, you know, and then we can come across here, is it a new process or is it a process improvement? Um, you know, is there a champion, Maria Swaby? Um, you know, 
Well, you know, as we go no, across, I think it's me. It's it's fast and PBS who does contracting. I just sort of okay. Know. But I think the point on a champion was like, you know, do you know, is is yeah. if we were presenting a recommendation and everybody that was on GSA was kind of like frowning, you know, we'd say, okay, maybe this isn't a great recommendation. So, um, so maybe we can walk through it. So. For let's talk about the um, second one. So GSA sponsored the creation deployment of an industry networking group directory exchange. Um, you know, is this something that's within GSA's purview? So I guess I'm going to look to GSA there to help guide us. Um, yeah. Yes. So I, 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 don't know, yes. I, I don't know why I made yes red, but this is what you get when you when it has me involved. Um, policy required. No. Oh, well, I couldn't figure out how to do this on the jam board, so I did it the old fashioned way. So that's a no? No, yeah. Uh, legislation required, no, right? No, no. So would you go? Is this a process improvement or is this a new yeah. process? It's improved. So, an imp so we're improving an existing process. So we'd have to make sure we kind of do a little due diligence on what exists and then how do you improve it? Um, reach Very here. Simple. Okay. Yeah. It's like um, a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's well, I think what I think part of our recommendation would be to move beyond the Excel spreadsheet and right so that it was a dynamic uh, database, for lack of a better word, that you know participants could eat to what um, Soraya said. If we promoted it, posted it, people had access. You know, new entrants could come to it. We wouldn't have to always look for them, right? We could promote it and. Uh, I don't know how we would do that, but stakeholders supported. Um, what did I have here? Did somebody else have the other sheet? We had some things in here. Let me just look real quick. Give me one second. So, um, Stakeholder supported, I think what we had in here is, would this help small businesses? Would this help the underserved community that uh, 8A targets? Does it, you know, is it inclusive of large businesses? Would it help new entrants? And so what I envision us putting here is just a list with check boxes. And I think this one would support all, right? I think it's a pretty uh, broad solution that would support and enhance all of our um, the supplier base. Does that make sense? So next time you see this, you'll see a little checklist here. We might have a recommendation that really helps small business, but doesn't help new new innovative entrants, you know, for climate or something like that. But does everyone kind of agree this one kind of reaches everybody? Did I lose you guys? Nope, we're Hello. here. We're here. Okay. We're here. We're here. We're here. So the stakeholders, are you looking for the individual list of stakeholders or? No, I, I didn't have time to get a list in here. This is where we said, does, does this recommendation support small business, uh, innovative new entrants, large business, large existing suppliers? Because some of our recommendations might be more targeted. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this one would hit all. I think it, it would hit all, right? Yeah, I think no. this is a very general one yeah. yeah yeah so if you could see that we would just check them all off so we'll get that in there for next time you know is there one of the questions we had is there an existing champion for this is there already somebody kind of that really would be a proponent of this and a champion i would um, i would include sba from a government side and i would include those community navigators um i'm just using that term but those that long list of groups that were included for outreach to diverse businesses. Yeah. I mean, the White House has signed a number of executive orders with a number of entities around this type of outreach. And I've spoken to a couple of them and they're like, well, we don't, what do we do next? Right? This could be in a very, very targeted request saying, this is exactly what we need you to do next. We need you to take this information from GSA and get it out to your community to identify the businesses that are capable of participating and interested in participating in this specific target industry. 
Yeah, I think that would be a, I, I, I see that as an outcome of, of the recommendation. I think the recommendation is kind of creating that, that exchange, right? So where everybody, there's transparent access to um, these groups and it's used as a conduit to push information out and also to get information and host and post as, um, so I would see like for more of what I'm thinking of champion here is who's going to support and kind of stay along with the recommendation as it's being implemented. That that's what I kind of, I'm thinking of as the champion kind of column so here. I, so I May think I offer can... that uh, there's SESs within GSA who have this in their performance, like Crystal, Jeff, the, the OGP, I would just put OGP because they have these in their performance plans, you know, right. so. So, uh, and we haven't socialized it with them when once we do, they might that this may right. come out. This will be an ongoing activity as we get down this road here. So does right. it make sense to request their input with regards to who they would reach out to? Because part of the issue uh, with the reason why this can navigator and all these MOUs are being signed is because despite every effort of having these goals and objectives, when they disaggregated the data, we found out the reality of who was actually receiving the contracts and it wasn't the target audience. Right. So the question yeah. is, does it make sense to now invite them to a conversation so we learn more about who they're currently targeting and uh, the, I, sort of like I, a gap analysis? No, I think the I, I don't I wouldn't recommend that because I think the thinking from Oren is we're looking for you to tell us what you know because okay. we already okay. have our challenge. So no, I wouldn't recommend that route at all. Yeah. I go so I, with I, okay, got it, got it. So and the, maybe how detailed do we want to get with yeah. regard to our prescriptive recommendations of who they would reach out to? Because yeah, I don't think we're there yet, Nigel. Okay. I think we need to go through this list of six right. and kind of <laughs> go through this high level assessment and then okay. prioritize the list, and then we'll have one or two two that we're going to put forward for May 4th and say it is this one, then we'll get very prescriptive in the pathway for implementation, mm -hmm. I would think, right? Got Isn't that kind it. of, yeah. that would be the logical step. Yeah. We're just trying to kind of figure out how to assess these six against each other. But we think there would be a champion. So I, yeah, I just there, believe that, yeah. There, there would definitely be OGP, but I would also add FAST, the Federal Acquisition Service. Uh, they've been thinking about this very issue here for a long time so i think fast and pbs i know less but i think they would also be interested in championing so i definitely think i agree with maria ogp and fast at a minimum would okay. be very interested in this because this conversation also came up in the similar conversation in the policy and practice subcommittee where we were looking at connecting um systems but it's more of a technology driven conversation okay Great. And then um, I'll come back to industry commitment because I didn't add the field in there, but let's go to like level of effort. So for level of effort from the team, this is really simple. This is just like, as you start to think about us doing this, do we see this as a low, medium or high level of effort? Um, and we could spend a lot of time defining what low, medium, high is, but uh, think about just kind of when you think about this, do you see this as something that is doable? We could get access to the right resources to help create the pathway for implementation. You know, high level of effort would be like something that's really complex and we'd have to get a lot of money for and, the, and um, lots of multiple agencies involved or something, you know, something like so, so, so just, they're, they're, this is so I'm thinking this is brainstorming. Yeah, thinking on two lenses here, the level of effort for the subcommittee to pull together a recommendation, and then there's a level of effort for GSA to implement it. So there's kind of two lenses here. Were you thinking more of the level of effort for the subcommittee to pull together the recommendation? I was thinking more for level of level of effort to implement. So I, that's how so, I was yeah. thinking about okay. it. Like if, so if, when we put this on a matrix of high, low effort, reward okay you know so when you think about that um and i don't think i have that in there we need to um let me add that that's a good point and again we'll um i think that's uh let's just do that 
And let's add here um, impact. I don't know if I had impact. So we'll do low, low, medium, high impact level of effort for implementation. Um, I think. Um, no, that, that think makes sense. Us? No, that makes sense. That makes so sense. do you guys, you know, when you think about the impact of creating this exchange of businesses and industry folks, and it's a two-way exchange and it's, allows every agency could then access it. You know, do you see that as a medium high or low impact recommendation? Like I personally think it's pretty high because we've heard all these people talk about how connecting people is the first step. And if we can't get beyond that, it's, it's hard to do anything else. I think it's high because it helps us build the ecosystem. I think if we're going to have a real impact, when we ask the question, what is this going to look like 10 years from now? We need to build this climate change and sustainability business ecosystem for the federal government. Mm -hmm. Good. Can I put high in there? I yeah, just because I, I have so. the pen, I don't want to wield the power here. Level of effort. So, from a, from when you think about this as a, uh, Maria, what is, what is your thought from or Boris from a GSA perspective? Um, I think low. I mean, compared to right yeah. getting legislation passed, this is really low. Yeah, we're not developing a new information system. I think oh. we're we're looking at what we already have. And is, is this the one where we're building the lighthouse? I really like that image, by the way. It's Kristen. Yeah, it's similar. It's, it's, yeah, it's really about the green the, lighthouse. <laughs> I The way I hearken it is to, like you heard Soraya, and we've heard others talk about this. Soraya said, oh, David, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand, but we'll get right to you. Uh, Soraya said, I kept an Excel spreadsheet. So. Some people are keeping an Excel spreadsheet. Maria, you said you had a, a list of people, a list of, you know, let's take that to the modern digital age where it is, you know, it's easily updated. Uh, it's available to all. There's data fidelity on the fields. Um, and you give the people on the end of that list power to update their own information as their business. You know, it's kind of like that market exchange of, who's out there who, who either wants to play in the field of federal procurement or, um, or we're trying to reach. David. Thank you very much. I didn't want to channel Soraya and say, so what? But um, I want to push back a little bit. I don't know that this is low. I mean, to the extent that there's something that exists which isn't meeting the needs that we've identified, it might be medium. I just don't know how much effort it takes to kind of create what you just said is, a system that is, let's say, uh, robust in the sense that people can access it who need it and update their own information. And the system knows when information is bad in the sense that, you know, the, it's a number field, but there's no number going into it um, or something like that, which kind of was what I understood you to say about it. Um, kind of, that's what I'm kind of, yeah. Yeah, I don't know anything about the architecture behind that. I don't know what kind of software. I mean, I'm sure all of us belong to any number of uh, sort of uh, personal networks, whether it's in your industry or in your other parts of your life, and they've got things like that. I, I just don't know what it takes to do that. I'm not suggesting Facebook, um, but uh, it might, well, I think it might be medium. Okay. And one thing I'm going to offer you guys is we're going to go through this fast. And then once we get them all done, we'll look at them against each other and say, well, geez, that one's those two both of those aren't low, like compared to each other, this one's gonna take more effort than that one. I think that'll help give some context too. So there's no right or wrong. We'll go through them. If we don't have right. enough information to like really do something well, uh, or as we garner more information, we can update. Like, so for example, timeline on this, you know, you know, I didn't know what to put in here. I put one year, two to three years, three to five, that might make GSA jump off the building. So I wanna make sure I'm sensitive to that, but, um, you know, so th th that means, let me just um, amplify on something, um, and I didn't say it clearly, explicitly, is that I'm thinking in two parts, sort of have basically the framework, and then to populate the framework, that's kind of where the medium comes in. I think, you know, it's one thing to build, it's another thing to populate it. I think we've talked about that before. 
Yeah, and I think we'd have to define that as part of the recommendation to your point. And I think it's a valid point, David, that we shouldn't just build it. We should help part of the pathway to implementation should be the promotion and adoption and how do you bring people to it, I think needs to be part of the recommendation from what I've heard. Like the lighthouse uh, analogy, um, just people have to be able to see it. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> That's a great, great uh, board picture. We're going to make a little icon. Um, <laughs> okay. What do you guys think here? Again, there's no, we're, we can come back and refine these. Uh, and if we don't have enough information, we won't, but it's, we need to, we need to get some level to kind of then do some prioritization here. Are you asking the time period to implement? Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, I think if you put the one year might be aggressive, but two to three years might be achievable. Okay. And then we have complexity. Um, so level of effort and uh, complexity, I would define as lots of moving parts, different stakeholders, you know, like um, trying to think of a good... Uh, well, like, so for example, like, uh, I think I had one there that Maria, you had given us some feedback might be really hard. I think it was five. Yeah, this whole concept of leveraging the collection of power of large to drive to help promote the small and create incentives, right? That's complex, right? Probably, right, versus, so that's how we kind of want to just look at this. So we're talking more in the ride a unicycle and juggle plates same time kind of complexity? Yes, yes, David, you're good at this. I, I need do to help facilitate. <laughs> that's a, that's a perfect example. So I I think the complexity on this is low. In, that's how I feel about it. So Kristen, we are right at time. Oh my God, we didn't even right. get through one. I'm just going to throw a low in there. So what I want to do for next week, it, do you guys see any? The, I think it would take us through the admin session next week. I think we can blast through this. And then what we can do is we can look at them comparatively. And so what, what this will allow us to do is when we prioritize which one we want to go forward with, we still have a running list of recommendations that, you know, we may be tabling some, right? And, uh, but we can socialize and we can articulate why we went with this recommendation and why we think it's important and help get the group to kind of acquiesce around that. So that's the, the benefit of this. And then we can throw them in a... Um, some some other formats as we go forward. Um, and I know it seems painful now, but trust me, it'll pay off in the end. And Kirsten, for our, our conversation next week, can we try to discuss prioritizing in the order of low-hanging fruit? I think on another subcommittee, we, we decided that we were gonna target something specific because it's something that we could actually deliver on as a subcommittee or as a full committee with recommendations mm -hmm. to GSA. I, I'd just like to see if we'd have that discussion around how do we put points on the board quickly and show value to GSA as a committee? So what, if, what are the things that if we were to focus on that we could come up with a great set of recommendations and submit it to GSA in the shortest turnaround time? Yeah, and I think this will help us do that. So if we say as a committee, you know, that short turnaround time and impact We'll be able to pull these real quick and say, well, out of these six, which ones have the shortest, uh, lowest level of complexity, highest impact, but shortest time frame, right? So then you'll be able to kind of to to see that. I think that's one of the things that will fall out of this. Or we can add a column that says, is this low hanging fruit? But I think, so for example, if we decide as a group, hey, we want to focus on those recommendations that we thought we could implement in uh, one to two years or whatever, you know, and then we can, we can, we can drive that. But I, I think once we get through this, Nigel, that's, that's what this will help us do, for sure. And what, one more concept I'll throw in there, and I know we're just a little over, is the idea of having volunteers or people that are passionate about any one of those that just kind of taking it on as a task force, if you will, like people that would actually take a lead in trying to build, you know, with you and, and Farad, Christine, 
being sort of uh, involved with that as well. But just that's some people that on the there. subcommittee or people yeah, outside but within the no within the subcommittee. So like gotcha. a couple of people said, okay, we're gonna two or three of us are gonna then really be the the driving force here, and then you know having that discussion depending on what you select to be your your low hanging fruit. Yeah, well, and really, when we when we get this done, these three in in particular, impact, level of effort, and timeline are gonna are gonna define the the low hanging fruit. Right. Yep, that's gonna fall right out of here, and we'll be able to plot it. I think it's also good to be able to say, you know, when because a lot of times people will say, oh, why don't you guys do this? And you can you're able to say, you know, we did consider that, and because of X Y Z, you know, we didn't prioritize that recommendation, and I think. That uh, those of us in government know we've had that happen to us all the time, right? So you got to be able to put things to bed. Okay, so if you guys want to be thinking about this, I'll try and get this updated. And what I'd like to do at the admin next week, though, is blast through this. Then we can look at it. And to Nigel's point, we'll begin to prioritize um, where we want to go based on what low hanging fruit level of impact, whatever, whatever we decide as a group. And I we hear GSA loud and clear on. Um, low hanging fruit. So that's good. Does it make sense to you guys? I know we, this was a long meeting today. Great. Okay. Very good. And then we'll be motoring. All right. Well, sounds good. I think we have a plan here and uh, good meeting today. We had great. Thank you for bringing Soraya. That was really great. Yeah. Great, she, great she'll stuff. be good. Good resource. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, and um, yep, yeah, so very good, guys. Five o'clock. I'll send out some notes, and um, we'll crank through this next week. All right, we will go ahead and adjourn. Thanks, everybody.